Welcome back to the Sports Management Podcast. This episode is sponsored by InSport Education and their new online course, The Foundation of Sport Business. With course modules delivered by sport business experts at companies like the NFL, the Football Association, and Formula E, the Foundations of Sport Business course equips you with everything you need to know to get on or accelerate your career in sport. And for you listeners, I have a great deal. With the code Sports Management Podcast 10, you will get 10% off the course price. Click the link in the description below and sign up to the course today. Now, let's kick off the episode. Welcome to Sports Management Podcast, where you will hear interesting sports management professionals share their stories, experiences, and passion for the sports management industry. I am your host, Marcus Philipsson. Today's guest is Tuhin Mishra, the managing director and co founder at Baseline Ventures. With several managerial roles, including general manager at IMG, this sports manager brings a lot of experience to the table. In this episode, you will learn about the sport Kabaddi, why sport is a sunshine industry in India, why COVID has resulted in an increased interest for esports, and much more. Welcome to the Sports Management Podcast, Chuhin Mishra. Thank you, Marcus. How are you? I'm very good, Marcus. We have mostly had American and European speakers so far on this podcast, so can you just uh, tell us a little bit about the sports industry in India and how the interest is around sports? It's a kind of a known fact here that in India, sports is growing and I would say it's like a sunshine industry. And uh, they say the sports market overall is almost like a close to 2 to $3 billion industry per year. And yes, cricket is the biggest sport in this country. Probably it captures almost 85 to 90% of all the spends that happen in this country. But interestingly, over the last five years, six years, we are seeing the whole evolution of a lot of other sports. There are sponsors, there are clients which are looking at non-cricket sports in a big way. Uh, Also non-cricket athletes as well. And that's a great sign because that actually gives hope to a lot of non-cricketers as well that they can make a decent living, a decent career uh, in terms of compensation. At the end of the day, yes, money does play a big part in terms of how the industry kind of grows in the long run. Of course. If we talk a little bit about your role as a managing director, what does this role include? So I co-founded Baseline in 2014 and uh, being the managing director of Baseline Ventures, my role includes everything in terms of managing the whole farm, looking after the business, how can we increase the business, how can we increase the different verticals that we operate in. So as a firm, we operate uh, in four to five verticals. One is sponsorship, second is uh, athlete representation, third is licensing, fourth is events, fifth is digital properties, and sixth is now also esports that we are focusing in. So yeah, so there are multiple things which are there and um, I do have my hands and ears in everything that happens within the uh, within the company. Uh, and obviously, we are a bunch of people. It's not just me alone, but I have my fellow co-founders, where all of us are completely involved in, including to the to the last mile, which in terms of doing sales and closing sales and closing deals and ensuring that those deals also see the light of the day. So I would say all of us are involved right till the end. I know that you represent athletes from a variety of sports and you mentioned that, of course, cricket is the biggest one. So can you tell us a little bit what other sports than cricket that you're working with? Absolutely. So one of the things when we were starting our athlete representation business was we were very clear from right from day one that we don't want to focus only on cricket because that's, uh, in a way, is a low-hanging fruit. So our whole focus was that let's look at other sports because we could create a name for ourselves and also give an opportunity to a lot of, I would say, very talented non-cricket athletes. And if we can do deals for them and do a good job for them, it will kind of help us differentiate with a lot of other firms which are operating in this space. And uh, that's why one of the first signings for us, or a couple of signings for us, was from the field of badminton, where we signed uh, P.V. Sindhu and Kidabi Shrikant. Again, both of them world champions. 
Shrikant was the former world number one in badminton. But all these happened after we signed them. So when we actually signed them, they were more in kind of unknown phenomena in the bigger scheme of things. Yes, they were very good in the field of sport that they were they are into. Uh, and then Sindhu obviously won a silver medal at the Rio Olympics. Yeah, so we have people from badminton. Then obviously we have people from cricket. So we manage some of the top cricketers, both in men and women as well. Then we manage uh, some of our hockey players. We manage probably one of the top two archers from India, uh, Deepika and Atanu, who are big medal hopes for us at the Tokyo Olympics. We manage a shooter, who again is a big medal hope. We manage a couple of boxers who are big medal hopes for us, Amit Fangal and, and Pooja Rani. So at the last count, we managed close to around 35, 36 athletes across different sports, in billiards, in, in squash, in swimming. So yeah, we do cover a wide variety of sports. Yes, definitely. Very wide variety there. So what exactly are you helping these athletes with? And does it differ in how you work with, for example, a badminton player versus a cricket player? See, one basic thing, which is across all athletes, is we need to get them deals. Like we need to get them sponsors. So that's an underlying fact. Obviously, with every athlete, they are in their different, I would say, cycle of evolution or cycle of development as well and a cycle of progress. And every athlete in that sense then becomes a lot more personalized in terms of what they require. So some athletes would require help. It could be in basic grooming as well. Some athletes would require help from a financial standpoint, like how do they manage their finances. And again, it all depends because, again, India is a vast country. People come from different walks of life, different strata within the whole uh, economic sphere. And uh, that's why our roles also are very different. It cannot be one size fits all one in that sense. So. I see. We have talked a lot about cricket and you mentioned badminton and hockey, which used to specify it's field hockey, right? Field hockey, yes. I fucking alien here. You know? Yeah, of course. The top five sports among them are cricket, football, badminton and hockey. But there was also a sport that I, to be honest, I've never heard about. It's called uh, kabaddi. Kabaddi, yes. Can you explain uh, what that is? Because I've never heard that before. So kabaddi is an indigenous sport. Again, very popular in the rural parts of the country. And again, as kids, a lot of guys have played it. And uh, this revolution of Kabaddi actually happened last seven, eight years when a league was developed around it. And uh, the broadcaster, which is Star, has done an excellent job around it. And uh, incidentally, now they are the second biggest league in the country after IPL, which is the cricket league. So, yeah. And uh, India has done well in the international sphere as well, especially at the Asian Games. Because Kabaddi is an Asian Games sport. So India has done well uh, over the last many years. Uh, but yes, since the league started here, uh, it has got a lot more focus. Uh, there are Kabaddi players who've become a couple of them uh, in terms of household names. And you know, a lot of firms and sponsors have come forward to support it as well. It's the third biggest sport in your country and India is a huge country. So do you think that this sport could spread to be more uh, popular worldwide? They are trying. They are trying. There is an international federation as well. And uh, I'm sure with time, you know, people will kind of uh, look at it much more seriously, I would say. Uh, but again, India itself presents such a huge number in terms of viewership, in terms of followers that a lot of times, you know, even if you do a good job in India, it's probably more than sufficient. It's almost like having a World Series for baseball and American uh, football. If you ask me, it's basically catering to a US audience, right? But again, the numbers which are there and the economics are out there, they are huge. So I would say we, one doesn't have to really kind of always think about whether it, what happens at a global level. Even if you do well at a country level and where you have numbers to kind of show, then why not? That's true. You mentioned previously that you have signed some esports athletes as well and that you have invested more in esports. And we had a previous episode about esports and the development of that sport. So how do you see the potential of esports in India? Uh, as a matter of fact, Marcus, what we see over the last, I would say, couple of years and also fortunately or unfortunately due to COVID, we are seeing a huge spurge in uh, esports and uh, there are uh, a lot of companies who are now looking at India very seriously. There are some big investments in that space. 
there's a league which is also happening in esports which is at a more formal level there would be franchise owners and everything and we manage one of the best esports team uh, in the country called Marcos Gaming they are really supremely talented bunch of guys and uh, yeah we also looking at the space very seriously and hopefully there will be some more interesting types for us down the line yeah, it will be very interesting to see how esports will take off. And uh, as you mentioned there with the COVID, I think that that obviously is a lot of negative side effects, but uh, maybe esports was one of the winners from the pandemic when, when people couldn't do the uh, more... Go outside and do the physical sports in that sense, yeah. Exactly. This episode is sponsored by InSport Education, the online business school for sport. They offer a range of different courses, for example, Foundations of Sport Business, Private Equity in Sport, and much, much more. As a listener to this podcast, you get 10% off all of their courses using the code SPORTSMANAGEMENTPODCAST10. Click the link in the description below and sign up today. Our next sponsor is ExpressVPN. If you, like me, are tired of not being able to access different Netflix libraries in your country, or watch sports games not available in your country, then ExpressVPN is for you. All listeners of this podcast get three months for free when signing up for a one-year package. Visit tryexpressvpn.com slash sportsmpodcast to learn more. You can find the link in the description below. In the second segment, we like to get to know the guest a little more. So uh, in your career, if I'm correct, you started in media and broadcasting, and then you started working for IMG, huge uh, sports management company, which is now uh, Endeavor. Yeah. Could you just talk about your career and where you started and up until today? Yeah. So from my studies and uh, those aspects, I did my uh, majors in bachelor's in economics, and then I did my master's in business economics as well. And then I started my career with the top global advertising firms, JWT, J. Walter Thompson. And I was in the media division, was working on the Pepsi account. And when this whole consolidation happened within the WPP group, and they formed a separate company called Mindshare, Bluepen. So yeah, I was part of that team of media planning and buying. Uh, spent a couple of years there, then moved briefly to McCann Erickson, where I used to work on the Nestle account. And then I moved to the other side of the table. I joined Time Warner which is Turner International and I used to look after a couple of kids' channels, which is Cartoon Network and there was another channel which was launched called Pogo and also briefly CNN. So after having spent, I would say, in the media broadcasting industry per se uh, for a few years, including my initial part of media planning and buying, I kind of decided and, you know, there was a, a chance or an opportunity that I got and I was always a sports person at heart as well. I've done serious level of swimming Obviously, I realized very early on that I couldn't be a Michael Phelps. So uh, <laughs> let me focus more on the academics than sports. So I did that. And uh, so, but sports was, has always been a big calling for me. Uh, and uh, so when I got this opportunity to work for IMG, uh, that was IMG Worldwide, uh, that I joined IMG, spent some time there, a couple of years again. And uh, I would say I had a great experience at IMG, learned a lot of things. I had a great bunch of guys with whom I worked there. And uh, from there, we moved to another company called Total Sports Asia, which is a Malaysian headquartered company. I again, spent some time there. Uh, I was there for almost close to six years. And then that entrepreneurial bug also kind of bit us, not only me, but a bunch of other guys. And we all decided one fine day, okay, let's do something on our own. So it was almost like a madman story. And we branched out on our own and we started Baseline. And we had, an, uh, I would say, we have a great bunch of guys who have been with us right from day one. So we didn't have to reinvent the wheel in that sense. Uh, so we did what we've always done. And uh, yeah, in the last, uh, I would say, six years, seven years, uh, effectively, we, with all humility, we are among those the top sports marketing firms in India. And we do take a lot of pride in terms of what we do as a firm. That's an incredible journey. And uh, I would assume that you have taken a lot of knowledge from your work at IMG that you have implemented now at the baseline. I wouldn't say only IMG. I would say at every place that I have personally worked at because there has always been some learning here and there. And there are a lot of things where we've learned what to do. And there are a lot of things that we've learned what not to do. 
how do you keep your costs under control uh, you know when you're a startup or even when you have grown as a firm and uh, yes i would say so it's just not i'm you but i would say every place the kind of culture that you have in the company how do you keep your uh, you know your colleagues and employees motivated so there are various aspects because it's just not a function of doing a deal or you know having some great business wins it's also kind of culture that you kind of take forward and you in a way hopefully you try and leave a legacy behind yeah we mentioned covid before how has uh, the pandemic affected your company just like any any company marcus it took all of us as a surprise none of us were prepared and uh, it didn't make uh, us kind of also think in terms of what to do next because suddenly every sporting event in the country was stopped or forced to stop they didn't have an option and uh, also some of the other things that we do outside india in terms of sports that also obviously for obvious reasons all got stopped so you know we had to kind of ensure that we had to think out of box so a lot of uh, thinking went behind doing things digitally so we started focusing on on creating di- digital properties so we created three digital properties where we had sponsors on board we had few of our athletes who were involved with that and also it also gave us time to in terms of do in- introspection in terms of as a form what all things can we do because you know one was the initial period of shock then obviously trying to kind of accept the fact that this is here to stay this is not going to go away in a month time or two months time we all hope go away in six months time and now we realize it's not then we had a second wave that again kind of pulled things back but we are very hopeful that things will become better and it is becoming better you know we you know have these like two steps forward and one step back and you can't help that Uh, but again i think we all have to live and survive in this atmosphere and keep i would say keep innovating as well yes for sure and i think that the pandemic has given us the opportunity let's say to take a step back and think about our business and what we want to achieve going forward so what would you say now when uh, hopefully we are uh, on the way out of the pandemic like what's what's the plan now for uh, baseline the plan for baseline is that See, I told you there are some six verticals that we are involved with. Uh, obviously, we are seeing how can we develop each of these verticals even more. How can we look at digital even more? And there are some interesting ideas that we have. There is also a league that we have just announced, which is uh, called Prime Volleyball League, which is going to be India's first independent professional league. So, uh, independent private professional league. and uh, that is again something which we are really working towards it there are some again a uh, couple of concepts which which are there and we are actually working on them and hopefully we'll be able to make some announcements very soon as well so yes i, I would say that now the plate the plate is surely full but again it's a function of how we finally see the light of the day on those particular projects or ideas that we have i see You mentioned previously that uh, you have some uh, co-founders and a few employees that have been with you from the start. So from you as a manager and as a leader, what would you say is your leadership style? I've always believed in very inclusive kind of working style where uh, at least I have realized from my own experiences that you need to delegate things, you need to empower people so they can also take decisions. they feel responsible with responsibility i have realized over the time it also brings along a lot of focus for individuals and a lot of people love that a lot of people cherish that and even if someone is an employee but if that person feels that he's working like an entrepreneur you know it kind of gives them that thrill or gives them that high which uh, you know as an individual i have always felt that i would love to get that when i used to be working elsewhere that if i had that kind of an opportunity I have to develop myself because it does kind of and as long as people are having fun and uh, at least i would say uh, you know our style and i would not just say my style but our style is not to keep things uh, very bureaucratic because i've seen that's the death knell of a lot of places a lot of firms uh, and again we are uh, you know very people oriented business you know our main asset are the people who work for us or who work with us so as long as we can manage them well i think a lot of things become much more smooth and in any creative business you need to have 
that or that bunch of guys who are equally passionate and who wouldn't mind waking up two o'clock in the in the night or in the morning and doing stuff as well when it's required. Yeah, definitely. I think that's a, that's a great way of looking at it. A lot of listeners for this podcast is tuning in from India. Assuming that these are people who either want to enter the sports industry or maybe want to take the next step in their career in the sports industry, what would be your best advice for someone with these aspirations? I would suggest that uh, they should kind of get an idea or knowledge about how this sports industry kind of works or operates in. There are, incidentally, and that's why I say it's a sun, uh, sunrise industry because there are a lot of uh, uh, sports management schools that have opened up now. So if I see in the last four or five years, there are a bunch of them. And say five years prior to that, probably there were just one or two. Mm. Now, if I'm, if I'm not missing, there would be at least 15, 20 of them. So that effectively shows that a lot of kids, and, and not only boys, but a lot of boys and girls are who are actually kind of interested in this field of sport. So that's very heartening. Uh, yes, once they graduate from there, they need to get themselves attached to some sports firm or some sports organizations. Money, they should be looking at money right from day one. The most important thing is that they should get an experience of working in an environment of sports and rest uh, things for I think that's great and uh, also uh, great to hear that the sports management education is uh, taking off in India as well. I mean, I live in Sweden and I would say that here it's not that big with the sports management. In US it's huge obviously, but I'm very glad to hear that also in India now it's becoming much more popular. Right, right, it is. Have you had any bumps on the road in your career, like any difficulties that you have overcome? And if so, how did you move on from that? See, Marcus, I would say... Like any individual or most of the individuals, we do uh, come across bumps, roadblocks in our career. And I've also experienced the same. The one thing which I've always realized is that family plays always a big part uh, in terms of giving you that support, that emotional support. Sometimes the support can also be by not interfering in terms of what is happening. right? So sometimes giving you that space. And I've always had that. So I would say a family has played a big part in terms of helping me overcome you know those tough moments uh, secondly it's also a function of how resolute you are as a person so whenever i've faced roadblocks and roadblocks we face a lot of times and roadblocks could be in various forms sometimes some big things are supposed to happen they don't happen sometimes the big things you are working on you worked on successfully and suddenly it's taken away uh, you know, so there could be various challenges that you face. At the end of the day, overcoming those challenges is a function of your own mental strength as well. How do you, uh, and I've always followed that. Sometimes you just need one good sleep and, uh, you know, you come out with a fresh thought. Uh, you know, a lot of times I've seen people get into you know, losing sleep and all those things and start worrying about things. I, I'm not saying that I don't worry. We all, we are all humans, but, uh, if you can channelize those uh, negative thoughts and try to keep them away as much as possible and then start thinking afresh because you will get your chances. So as long as you're willing to slog it out, I think you will. there's always light at the end of the tunnel, as they say. So if you're getting a difficult situation at the end of your workday, you will sleep on it and look at it with fresh eyes the day after. Yes, or do something different in terms of you know, you go and play some sport or you watch some movie, basically kind of try and distract yourself and try to think as less as possible. Because there are times, you know, there are two things I've, I've read somewhere. When you are facing a, a tough situation, there are only two solutions to it. One, that it doesn't have a solution, right? So there is no point in worrying about it because it cannot be solved. So what's the point? The other thing is that you need to think about what is the solution to that problem. Instead of thinking that, why did this problem happen to me? Because we get into that rut, oh, why me, why me? You know, that kind of thing, why did it happen to me? Well, you're one of them. So you need to think about that solution to that problem. So if you can follow those two mantras or those principles, I think a lot lot of things can be really easy. I think that's great advice and a very healthy mentality, I would say. Approaching the end here, is there something that I haven't asked you that you would like to mention or something you want to bring up? Uh, no, Marcus, I mean, I think we've covered pretty broad in terms of what I've done in my life and what I do for a living. So there is nothing more to it. 
I, I would only probably say as my as my you know as a sign off uh, statement is that uh, very famous saying I had read somewhere that that all our life we run after having more and more clothes without realizing that the best time that we have is without clothes. So the the deeper meaning is that you know we need to look for happiness and whatever it gives us you know wherever you can find those happiness it, you know you need to try and strive for that rest i think there are more you know the basic stuff that's a great insight the last question uh, that i ask is if you could choose the next guest on my podcast who would you recommend that i would speak to no oh, that's a that's a tough one <laughs> <laughs> probably you can get some of any athlete you think who can throw a perspective on how they feel like being in part of the sports business it's not just performances but what they expect uh, out of a, a manager or the order of a professional who manages them or something like that probably that could be a nice insight yeah for sure chuhin mishra thank you so much for taking the time uh, to be on the sports management podcast and uh, if the listeners uh, want to uh, follow you on are you on some different social medias yes i am there on twitter and instagram yeah chuhin mishra 75 that's great Thank you so much. Thank you so much Marcus. Pleasure talking to you. Thank you for listening to the Sports Management podcast. Please hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out on any upcoming episodes. Also, feel free to leave a comment about what you thought about this episode. If you want to get in contact with me, send an email to sportsmpodcast@gmail.com or hit me up on Facebook, Twitter or Instagram. at Sports M Podcast.